the LCP Distal Humerus Plate System. Fractures of the distal humerus are uncommon. They generally result from either high-speed trauma or from low-energy impact in existing osteoporosis. Since C-type injuries are unstable joint fractures, as a rule, surgical stabilization is necessary. The goals of the procedure are the anatomical reconstruction of the joint, the restoration of axial mobility, and the restoration of stability, which allows early functional exercise of the elbow joint. The distal humerus plate system is made up of plates specifically formed for the stabilization of distal humerus fractures and has been especially developed for very distal or epiphyseal fractures and fractures in osteoporotic bone. The objectives of this presentation are to demonstrate the surgical approach, the exposure of the fracture zone, and the application of the distal humerus plate system to a very distal C1 humerus fracture. The exercise is designed to make clear both the function and practical application of the distal humerus plate system. Prior knowledge of both the conventional plating techniques and the LCP principle is necessary. This demonstration is based on a clinical case. The patient is a 68-year-old male who suffered a fall at home. The resulting C1 distal humerus fracture with significant hematoma and contusion of the atrophic skin are consistent with his age. In patients with extensive soft tissue damage, multiple injuries, or in polytrauma cases, initial stabilization with a joint bridging external fixator may be necessary. Because of the delicate soft tissue situation, in this case, a joint bridging external fixator was applied. The plates of the distal humerus plate system are preformed to match the anatomy of the bone. The dorsolateral plate is available either with or without a support. Here, the dorsolateral plate with support is used. The following instruments are needed. The 0.8 Newton meter torque limiting attachment with quick coupling and the positioning and compression device with length markings for the dorsolateral plate with support. Also needed are the 2.7 LCP drill sleeve with thread and scale and the 2 millimeter drill bit with double markings. Pre-operative planning is mandatory and its success depends on adequate image quality. Correct identification of the fracture pattern with a drawing of the position and number of fragments is needed for planning. To obtain sufficient exposure of the fracture, the patient is placed either in a lateral or a prone position. The prone position is the favored option. A short arm support is used so that the surgeon may sit. Care must be taken to ensure that the elbow can be flexed at least to an angle of between 110 and 120 degrees. If bone graft is needed, a donor's site should be prepared. A sterile tourniquet applied sufficiently proximal is recommended. However, it should be inflated only if needed to control any major bleeding. In this case, a tourniquet was not used. The fracture is approached through a straight posterior incision, which is slightly curved, just radial to the olecranon, as marked on the foam model. The animation shows the location of the incision. It starts on the humerus and follows a gentle radial curve around the olecranon to the ulnar crest. The ulnar nerve is identified. It may need to be isolated and elevated at the ulnar epicondyle. The tissue retractor is used to hold the incision open. When longer plates are used, the radial nerve also has to be carefully identified. With comminuted fractures, 
The best fracture exposure of the distal humerus is obtained with a chevron osteotomy of the olecranon. A chevron osteotomy pointed distally is preferred to a transverse cut to make the reconstruction by tension band wiring easier. It is advisable to turn the triceps muscle proximally, holding it in place with a suture. The osteotomy exposes the articular fragments and allows visual confirmation that the reduction is correct, especially the rotation of the fragments. The level of the osteotomy is marked. The oscillating saw is used and the bone is cut almost completely across. The separation is completed with an osteotome to avoid a loss of substance at the articular level. For the exercise, the osteotomy may be completed with the oscillating saw. The cut tip of the olecranon is elevated and reflected. If any foam enters the fracture, it should be gently removed in the same way that fragments are cleared from hematoma. The fracture situation is now assessed and the reconstruction started. For C-type fractures, the articular fragments of the distal block are reduced first under visual control and fixed temporarily with K-wires or the pointed reduction forceps as demonstrated here. The distal block then is fixed provisionally to the shaft using K-wires or the pointed reduction forceps in both columns. The fracture has to be reduced anatomically and compressed before the locking head screws are introduced because the design of the screw does not permit additional compression. The correct reduction of the distal humerus is verified. The plates of the distal humerus plate system do not require exact contouring since they function according to the principle of the internal fixator. However, as the form of the distal humerus varies among individuals, it may be advisable to adapt the plate if it diverges too much from the shape of the bone. In such a case, bending pliers or bending irons are used to bend the plate. The dorsolateral plate permits screw insertion in a posterior anterior direction. The plate with support allows additional screw insertion through the lateral epicondyle in a lateral medial direction. The length of the plate should provide sufficient fixation proximal to the fracture lines. To prevent excessive stress on the diaphysis, the dorsolateral and medial plates should be different in length and should not end at the same level of the bone. The plate is positioned on the dorsolateral aspect of the distal humerus. The distal spoon-shaped portion covers the non-articulating part of the capitellum free of cartilage. The lateral support reaches over the most protruding tip of the lateral epicondyle, just proximal to the lateral collateral ligament insertion. The shaft portion of the plate is positioned at a safe distance from the olecranon fossa. The position of the plate should allow the screws inserted through the lateral support to reach the articular block of the trochlea on the medial side. The direction of the screw to be used can be visualized either with the LCP drill sleeve and a K-wire or with the positioning and compression device. There is a possibility that the screws introduced with the distal humerus plate system may collide with the interfragmentary lag screw that fixes the joint block. In the case of a very distal fracture line where each screw in the distal fragment is needed, such a contact would be a problem. To avoid screw contact, the positioning and compression device may be used. This device also acts as an aiming tool, predefining the position of the screw used to stabilize the joint block so that there is no interference with the other screws in the plate. As a locking head screw is used for the joint block, interfragmentary compression must be created with the positioning and compression device. The screw that is inserted will then function as a positioning screw. Here, the use of the positioning and compression device is demonstrated. It is important that the distal position of the plate is carefully chosen. Any interference with the radial head would result in a loss of extension. 
Normally, the distance between the plate and the cartilage should not be less than three millimeters. Because of the locking head feature, fixation with the LCP does not require the direct plate-to-bone contact used for conventional plating. The positioning and compression device plus the drill sleeve will now be used. The dorsolateral plate is approximately positioned. After the plate has been placed precisely, it is secured to the humerus shaft. The two millimeter drill bit is inserted through the universal drill guide and a bicortical hole is drilled in the shaft. The length of the cortex screw is measured with the depth gauge. Tapping is necessary or not, depending on whether a conventional cortex screw or a self-tapping cortex screw is used. The 3.5 millimeter cortex screw is inserted, but not fully tightened, using the small hexagonal screwdriver. The aiming block is attached. The positioning and compression device is mounted. The contact point on the medial side indicates the exit point of the screw that will be inserted through the hole of the plate, thus showing the exact path of the screw. K-wires may be inserted through the aiming block for temporary fixation. The screw length should include a safety margin depending on the position. The hole is drilled using the 2 mm drill bit. The drill bit will exit the bone at the medial point of contact of the positioning and compression device. A K-wire may be used instead of the drill bit to verify the correct position of the plate and screw before drilling. The drill sleeve is removed and the 2.7 mm locking head screw is inserted through the positioning and compression device. The locking head screw can be introduced either manually or with the power drive in combination with the torque limiting adapter. It is important that the torque limiting adapter is used to prevent the screw from being jammed in the plate hole. More screws are inserted as needed. At least one screw on the lateral side has to cross the distal block. Depending on the size of the humerus, the screw length is between 40 and 60 millimeters. The LCP drill sleeve and the 2 millimeter drill bit are used to make additional holes. For the capitellum, the recommended screw length is between 16 and 24 millimeters. However, care must be taken when inserting the screws for the capitellum to make sure that the screws are not too long to avoid damaging the joint surface. Additional screws are inserted as needed. It is recommended that the position of the screws is checked with the image intensifier while the elbow is flexed. The positioning and compression device is now removed. The proximal part of the plate is secured with locking head screws. The threaded drill sleeve is carefully screwed into one of the plate holes on the proximal side of the fracture. The screw hole is drilled bicortically with a 2.8 millimeter drill bit. The required screw length is read directly from the drill bit. As an alternative, the depth gauge can be used to check the length of the screw. The LCP locking head screw is inserted using the screwdriver shaft mounted on the torque limiting adapter. The screw is introduced manually or with the power drive until a click is heard and felt. If the power drive is chosen, its speed should be reduced when the head of the locking head screw approaches the plate. The procedure is repeated until all the required screw holes in the shaft of the plate are filled. The best fixation to the shaft needs a minimum of three screws inserted bicortically. The screws are checked to make sure they're locked. The medial plate is positioned on the medial ridge or slightly dorsal to the intermuscular septum with the distal tip reaching down to the insertion of the medial collateral ligament. The drill guide with double scale is used to hold and place the plate onto the bone so that the plate's best position can be determined. 
A K-wire advanced through the drill sleeve in the distal hole is used to establish the distal plate position. The K-wire must not interfere with the already inserted screws. The drill guide and the 2.5 millimeter drill bit are used to drill both cortices. The length of the cortex screw is found with the depth gauge. A 3.5 millimeter cortex screw is inserted through the long hole of the plate. The distal part of the plate is fixed to the bone. Drilling has to be done carefully so that the drill bit does not collide with the screws which have been placed from the opposite side. If a collision occurs, drilling is stopped and a more appropriate length screw is inserted. The remaining holes are used for the insertion of additional screws. It is recommended that at least one screw cross the distal block on both the medial and lateral sides. The screws are 40 to 60 millimeters long, depending on the size of the humerus. The fixation is completed with locking head screws. The procedure is repeated until all the required screw holes in the shaft of the plate are filled. For optimal fixation to the shaft, a minimum of three screws inserted bicortically should be used. The K wires are removed. The electronon is reduced and secured with the pointed reduction forceps. Two 1.6 millimeter K wires are inserted parallel to each other through the electronon into the ulna. A transverse two millimeter hole is drilled into the ulna two centimeters distal to the osteotomy, and a piece of circlage wire one millimeter in diameter is pushed through the hole. The figure of eight wire loop is fastened and tightened while the elbow is in slight extension. The K wires are cut and bent. Now the K-wires are completely sunk into the electronon. After removal of the rubber restraint from the ulnar nerve, the incision is closed in the usual way. The post-operative radiographs demonstrate the excellent reconstruction of the surface of the joint, the stable fixation of the distal humerus to the shaft, and the correctly positioned implants. It can be seen that the plates are well contoured to the distal humerus. After removal of the suction drain and uneventful wound healing, early functional physiotherapy was started immediately.